Thank you, Rohit. Um, Mr. Mehta, uh, Mr. Agarwal, Mr. Enters, Mr. Amburla, and Rohit, and all my industry friends right in front of me, all stalwarts, uh, leaders, and all the other industry participants. Uh, a very good morning to you and a warm welcome. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. And I didn't realize and I had forgotten all about it until Rohit just last minute uttered the words that 98 we formed. This IPMA, the IPMA, there were two IPMAs existing. Gopal uh, will remember Indian Paper Mills Association, Indian Paper Makers Association. So some of us were on this IPMA, some of us were on that IPMA, and then uh, uh, we decided, some of us, that we should put this together, uh, encouraged, uh, and Rupal was very much part and parcel of this. So I didn't realize it's been 35 years, if we talk about 19. So uh, you should be celebrating, well, actually we should not talk about 25 years. IPMA is more than 100 years old. And that is how we should look at ourselves. Uh, Mr. Mehta talked about um, um, a whole lot of issues, uh, opportunities, challenges uh, for the paper industry. And uh, it is a very old and established industry. One of the earliest um, industries and enterprises uh, we started in this country in the 19th century. Uh, but it remains, despite all the buzz around digitization, etc., etc., it still remains a very, very important part of our uh, daily lives, of society, of our community, and indeed of our development through education. Uh, I have a different, um, I, I want to put before you some points regarding the industry, and I have a small presentation as well. We, we got uh, the presentation ready and all that stuff? Yeah. Yes, okay. yeah, you're there? Okay. But before I get there, let me just make a couple of points on in general. Mr. Mehta, you were right in saying that, um, you know, at the end of the day, we have to look at various things affecting the industry or impacting the industry, I should say. Uh, raw material security has always been an important issue, but more important than ever. And we are today seeing, if we talk of the wood-based industry, we are today seeing a lot of challenge or competition coming from other wood-based non-paper industry participants, i.e. Uh, the plywood industry, the building materials industry, a whole lot of others. Now, unfortunately, none of them have done any plantations. So at the end of the day, whatever paper industry does, they they harvest and take, and which is a challenge. It can start with some pockets in some states or some regions, but at the end of the day, if raw material is expensive in one place, we go to some other place which is where it is cheaper and then the whole, you know, it's a cascading effect. So in fact, I had asked and Mr. Mehta has initiated, I know, some dialogue. I think we should talk to the other uh, wood-based industries which are non-paper producing. It could be furniture, it could be whole lot and explain to them that at the end of the day their prospects also get affected. Uh, and uh, I would encourage and you know, we, we are not talking against them. In fact, we are wanting to take them along and we are happy to share whatever we know of plantation with them. So as uh, together we can do much more. And besides, the more we do, we are also working on environment, we are greening India, etc., etc. So I think that is one thought I'd like to sort of uh, leave here uh, with you. The second thing is, uh, you know, there will always be challenges. But uh, I think we have to remember two things. One is that the competitiveness of any industry, it's not to do with the paper industry, has to be there. No industry can live with, um, if I may use the word, artificial or temporary barriers. 
So we can have the higher standards. Just this morning you read uh, something like 18,000 toys removed over the last one year from stores because they are not meeting the higher standards. That's fine. But that is not going to be the long term differentiator. So whether we talk in terms of a variety of other things, uh, at the end of the day, any business has to be competitive. And that's what we have to work towards. And, and uh, wherever <coughs> we have to work towards it internally as uh, manufacturers. Uh, but wherever there are policy issues or government interventions, my experience in the last few decades has been Yes, it's easy to say that, you know, government doesn't listen. Very often they don't. But very often it is also a delayed listening. So the issue is how well we articulate our, our issues, our points. And uh, we'll have to repeatedly do it. If it doesn't work once, we keep going at it. And, and we have seen, in, uh, like so many policies, it takes sometimes years. And, but it, uh, you know, people understand. Somebody understands at some point. Uh, now, apart from our main ministries, which is, you know, DIP, DIPT and uh, MOEF is, I think, very important. But uh, uh, I would uh, suggest to the IPMA leadership, uh, Mr. Agarwal now, Papaji, will be taking on the mantle. Uh, you know, in our country, the Prime Minister's office is now very important to PMO. So if you want something to be heard, uh, we have to make, of course, a very cogent um, sort of argument and a very good logic as to why this is good. But I would believe there is a synonymity with the agenda on two, three fronts. One is in terms of sustainability, green climate. The second is in terms of jobs. What uh, we sometimes undermine is that it's not just the paper industry or a paper mill which is creating jobs. But it is the entire indirect jobs ecosystem through services, through transport, through a whole bunch of other vendors that gets created. And most importantly in plantation activity for example. There is a huge number of jobs particularly in rural areas in, um, in, in, in areas where it's hard to find employment. And even if we talk in terms of recovered paper, uh, the whole collection cycle, we need to improve that the collection of, of paper. Uh, as Mr. Mahinda rightly put it in the case, it should be recovered fiber rather than waste paper. And that is also fairly manual at this point in time. Although uh, I must say just two days ago, uh, Mr. Mehta and I witnessed some very interesting presentations, nothing to do with the paper industry but to do with the plastics industry actually. But how all this collection, sorting and a whole lot of other things are happening now in a highly automated manner. The same can be done, uh, we spoke to some people there who are making these machines and the same can be done for, uh, for paper or waste paper collection. Of course they will have to customize things. Uh, so I think that is another chord which can be uh, you know, touched on in terms of this. And the last chord would be clearly that we are, uh, the Indian paper industry is truly Atmanirbhar. It is truly domestic. It caters to the domestic market, it produces domestically, it uses by and large domestic uh, raw materials and inputs. So actually it is a shining example of a domestically created industry and therefore that's another call to the government. So I think if we package things in a manner, we should be able to, uh, you know, get some, uh, get, get ourselves heard. So that is um, the general part of um, what, I mean, I wanted to add, not in my slides, but some general parts. Uh, sustainability is going to be another very important thing. And I think that's the area that we need to, uh, we are already looking at, but that's something we will continue to, I think the industry needs to continue to focus on that. Uh, one uh, other thing, you know, we talk about paper being, of course, it is biodegradable, com compostable, uh, natural, etc. And we say that plastics is, um, you know, the problem, the ban on single-use plastics, etc., etc. That's all fine. My strong belief is that every industry, there are trillions of dollars invested 
in the plastics industry or the polymers industry globally is not going to go away. Every industry will find ways and reinvent themselves. So you will have bioplastics, you already have. You will have much greater recycling of plastics. And the net, you will have biodegradable stuff happening. So the net effect is going to be that plastics is also reinventing itself and is going to reinvent itself in a major way. So if we think that you know plastics will go away and then fiber based or paper industry will have uh, you know, a field day, I think we should uh, not think like that and pass that way. So we have to, at the end of the day, when we talk about solutions from paper, we have to look at two things. And that's what at least I ask my colleagues in the company, whenever we make something, whether it's a board or whatever it is, I said, look, at the end of the day, is it giving you the functional performance that is substitute product? Whether it's plastic, whether it's glass, whether it is anything. And secondly, is it economical? Is it, are you being able to deliver that at the same price point? I think that is where we in the paper industry need to focus on to see that we are able to come up with solutions that are both economical to a customer as well as uh, meet the performance uh, criteria and standards. So with that, I will um, um, stop giving my general gamut and come to some specific issues I want to put before you, but I thought I must bring this in a particular manner just to share thoughts uh, uh, with you. So the global pulp and paper industry is undergoing a massive transformation. While on the one hand we are observing structural changes in the form of consolidation and shift in product portfolio, on the other hand the industry is preparing itself to address issues such as climate change, sustainability, biodiversity, etc. The global paper market continues to grow at a CAGR of 0.5 to 1%, pivoting strongly on the packaging segment. The decline in, though the decline in printing and writing segment is evident from the fact that printing and writing segment constituted about 39% of the industry in 2010 and is now only 21% by 2020. Large group global players Large companies like IP, Stora, Enso, SAPI have carved out their printing and writing businesses and focus now on the packaging segment. The Indian paper market remains the fastest growing market, at least the major market, globally led by growth in the packaging segment. Printing and writing is still growing in India, though outlook for certain segments within printing and writing, that is, coated, newsprint and cream wove, is not positive. Printing and writing segment, the segment, has shrunk from a 50% share in FY 2010-11 to about 32% in FY 2021. On the other hand, the packaging segment has increased from 47% to 62% in the same period. And within the printing and writing segment, of course, items like copier and applicos are, are still continuing to grow. The pulp and paper industry is therefore witnessing extraordinary challenges. And the winner will be required to transform, adapt, and innovate. As per the global consulting firm McKinsey, the shifts in the pulp and paper industry so far in this century can be described in the following buckets. If we look at 2000 to 20, 2010, the first 10 years, uh, there has been a shift in regional dominance. So, geographic shifts in pulp and paper production, subsequent growth among Chinese, other Asian and South American market participants, mergers in Europe and North America in a bid to create a tr truly global corporations. 2010 to 2020, the next decade, start of a structural change. Structural change, that is, slowdown of graphic paper, boom in packaging paper segment, which has been aided by the rise of e-commerce, closures and conversions of machines, China's influence on in world markets, recovered paper, pulp, and the growth of the Chinese and Indonesian companies to become really large scale. Innovation, but not so much of commercialization in that decade. Continual mergers and acquisitions, consolidation, 
and value chain integration with people becoming more integrated. Now, let's try and gaze at what could happen in the, in the coming decade, 2020 to 2030. The need to transform, adapt, and innovate. There's extraordinary disruption and shift in consumption patterns, regulation, e-commerce, the COVID-19 pandemic, all created a, a mix and the geopolitical conflicts coming now. So new products which need to be commercialized. The sustainability agenda is now moved and become far more serious. It's no longer talk, but there is action. There are issues around that and people have to walk the talk. The climate issue and bio biodiversity risk in operations, sourcing, traceability. These are all things which are real now. These are not talks or seminars and uh, things. Customers want stuff that you can trace. They, can, they want to know the origin. They want to know where it is planted, what kind of labor you're using in your factory, what, uh, you know, the whole, the whole speed. Digital adoption, very, very important for the industry. And the portfolio changes with closures, conversions, carve-outs. So sustainability today has three key pillars, environment, social, and economic. However, I'd like to focus on environmental sustainability. The environment or planet aspects of sustainability has two dimensions. The process, which is resource efficient process, and the product, which is easy to recycle products or substitution for fossil based materials. Because this, uh, the substitution for fossil based uh, inputs is again real. This is something, we have various standards that have come, and if you see the push for sustainability will be driven by regulation, will be driven by governments. So for example, a large number of countries have come out with a target for net zero emissions. So the US has said we'll achieve net zero emissions by 2050, and a ban on single-use plastics on public land by 2032. The EU has said uh, net zero emissions by 2050, as well, and a ban on single-use plastic from 2021. Canada, uh, net zero by 2050, and zero plastic waste by 2030. India, as you all know, have, we have said that we want to get to net zero by 2070, but a ban on single-use plastic is already effected from July 22. It's a different matter how strongly it is adhered to in different stages. And China has talked about 2060 as the year when they get net zero emissions, and there is a proposal to ban single plastic use bags by 2025. So, what, are, what is the industry doing? Companies are responding with bold declarations, mainly towards reduction of plastics, carbon emissions, etc. If you know, you would have noticed that top 100 FMCG companies have made declarations towards adopting sustainable packaging, focusing on increased recycled content. Reducing use of plastics, for example, the elimination of plastic peripheries such as single-use bags, reducing packaging weight, etc., and innovating plastic substitutes. Likewise, several large corporates have made declarations towards becoming carbon neutral, adopting a 100% renewable energy strategy, utilizing biomethane to lower carbon footprint, and so on. The good news is that the pulp and paper industry, this shift towards sustainability is actually an opportunity rather than a challenge. The pulp and paper industry inherently has sustainability, ladies and gentlemen, at the core because wood products such as pulp paper are renewable, biodegradable, recyclable. Cellulose and lignin are the biggest renewable sources of carbon. Pulp and paper making is an integrated closed loop process. And recovered paper can be recycled multiple times to produce various papers, brown paper grades, and boards, thereby increasing the lifetime value of paper. Thus, the pulp and paper industry is truly at the heart of the circular economy. And I, I genuinely believe this, I keep saying this when I'm there at various public forums, that we are truly in the heart of the circular economy. Now it's up to us to communicate it, and not just communicate it, but demonstrate it with sustainable products. Large global pulp and paper companies 
have moved towards sustainability. As reflected, if you look at, take out, go to the websites and take out uh, their mission, their vision and mission, etc. And you'll find that there is a renewed vision and purpose for most of these companies. They are now aiming at substituting fossil fuel based, uh, fossil based materials, for example, plastics and graphite with renewable products, that is wood consumes. In other words, future beyond fossils, as UPM puts it. Sustainability moves are increasingly observed in the pulp and paper industry by both manufacturers and consumers. Let's take the example of some manufacturers. UPM is setting up an industrial scale biorefinery to produce biochemicals. That is going to be glycols to replace fossil based ingredients in a wide variety of industrial applications, which is expected to start this year. Susana, is, which is in Brazil, is setting up a JV for producing of the production of sustainable textiles from cellulose fibers as a substitute for cotton to make 100% of its packaging recyclable or reusable by 2025. Uh, Stora is conducting trials for lignin based hard carbon as sustainable substitutes for graphite anode in batteries, and so on. If we take the example of customers, Nestle has said it aims to make 100% of its packaging recyclable or reusable by 2025. Coca Cola aims to make 100% of its packaging recyclable by 25, and using at least 50% recycled material in packaging by 2030. Diageo and Pe PepsiCo, large beverage manufacturers, want to use paper-based bottles for beverage packaging. Their technology provider has partnered with Stora to mass-produce paper bottles. In India, Praj Industries has developed a technology to produce a lignin-based biovitamin, which can be used in road construction as a replacement of oil-based bitumen, and so on and so forth. All I'm trying to say through this is that there is so much else happening beyond pulp and paper. And the heart of this is fiber and our process. And that's where we perhaps need to think about beyond pulp and paper. We will continue to make pulp and paper for paper <coughs> uses, but let's think beyond this. In India also, there are several startups that have emerged in the last five, six years, uh, which are using fiber-based material in the areas of food, packaging, hygiene, etc. Now coming to technology, I think our industry in India, Mr. Mehta also outlined and mentioned, has made a lot of progress. The plantation acreage has improved significantly over the last few years leading to raw material security and social farm forestry initiatives have been very successful. I can share with you that our own company, JK Paper, uh, has increased its annual plantation area by three times between the years, let's say, 2011 to this year, from about 6,700 hectares per annum to more than 20,000 hectares per annum. And today, as a result of this, I'm happy to state that we are both wool positive as well as carbon positive as a company. Mills are shifting towards things like continuous digesters for pulping, lower energy consumption, more stable pulp quality, and lesser impact on the environment. Many people have gone on to ECF, although globally, TCF is the, is the norm. Better fiber recovery in stock prep. Um, and all of this lowers raw material cost. The new paper machines are, are larger, modern, more computer controlled, <clears throat> which leads to improved energy efficiency and better productivity. Warehouse and storage systems have moved to automated storage and retrieval systems, which has increased efficiency, better handling, and so on. Uh, the use of de inking chemicals have reduced through better technology. So there are a lot of things, this is what Indian industry has done, but there is more that we need to do. So the raw material security, which we have talked in terms of, is for self-sufficiency in plantation through better R&D for plant species uh, and tree species that offer benefits to both the industry as well as the farming community. We need to develop strong, recovered, 
paper supply chains. That is one big area. We need to maximize value from existing operations and to drive resource efficiency, reduce fossil fuels, water, minimize and maximize value from the waste or side streams. Therefore, closing the loop and finding a use for everything. Mr. Mehta talked about water consumption, electricity consumption, which have come down very significantly. I can say from our own experience, we have seen this with better technology, how this has made a dramatic difference. Digital adaptation. We need to leverage digital to improve efficiency, productivity and transparency <coughs> in manufacturing. Now, we at JK Paper have been working towards adoption of digital in business transformation. As a part of this, we have been able to implement various projects which are both at the front end, that is on the demand customer side, as well as at the back end in the manufacturing end. And we are seeing a lot of benefits uh, from these kinds of things. So it, there's no rocket science around it, any business can adopt it, and I'm sure you're doing it all. But these are all leading to more efficiencies, lower costs, uh, lower usage of natural inputs. One very important thing is about talent. I think it's extremely important that today when we are looking at automated or computer controlled or uh, DCS controlled machines um, and the use of digital analytic tools, there is a need to rethink about talent.